Steve Adubato here. This is, in fact, the Leadership Hour. You're listening to us on AM 970, The Answer, with my colleague Mary Gamba here. Uh, Mary, hopefully we will have some answers today and every week on the Leadership Hour. I'm sure. I'm sure that people are tuning in every Sunday at 2 p.m. to hear all the great leadership tips and tools that we have to offer. And by the way, uh, if you miss us on the radio, which would be shocking if you miss us at 2 p.m. on Sunday, you'll catch us on a podcast that we're sending out as well. Uh, Mary, today in just a few seconds, we're just going to be speak. We'll be speaking to our good friend Kevin Cummings, who leads Investors Bank. He's been leading it through an incredible transformation. Talk about change, leading change, which is one of the topics I want to talk to Kevin about. Uh, he'll talk a little bit about investors and how they've evolved with their culture, changed, grown, and how he gets people to be on board when that is difficult to do, since a lot of people are so. Sometimes resistant to change, resistant to change. Mary, real quick, biggest reason why you think, before we get Kevin Cummings on the line, biggest reasons why you think people may be resistant to change? It's terrifying. Change is scary. It's something new. It means that's something that we are comfortable doing, whether it's a week, a year, 10 years, something that we are very familiar with is going to be different. And that's very scary for a lot of people, both at work and in their personal lives. You mean emotionally, viscerally? I think that's where it starts the second that someone hears about that change. And then when it goes down to the operationalizing that mm -hmm. change and figuring it out and putting that to-do list together of what actually it would take to make that change, it gets even scarier. Isn't it amazing? By the way, this is the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour. If you want to find out uh, about some articles that I've written on the subject of leadership, I've been uh, particularly change. I've been thinking about writing about coaching, teaching, and living leadership and making tons of mistakes, particularly if you get my book, Lessons in Leadership, you will read in gory detail about those mistakes. But check out our website, stand-deliver.com, stand-deliver.com. By the way, Mary, uh, I, I need and want more smart Twitter followers. How Absolutely. exactly can people do that? I was just going to jump right in. You can follow Steve on Twitter, Steve Adubato. That's A-D-U-B-A-T-O. You can find him on Twitter at Steve Adubato. What about Facebook? Steve Adubato, Ph.D. You worked very hard for that, so we uh, they can find you at Facebook at Steve Adubato, Ph.D. That's from Rutgers University. I want to thank Rutgers for bestowing a doctorate on me. Uh, my kids will often say, that's right, Dad. You are the kind of doctor that basically can't help anyone. <laughs> uh, but hopefully we'll help people on this Leadership Hour, and we're about to do that with our good friend Kevin Cummings, who is the chairman and CEO of uh, Investors Bank. Um, Kevin, how you doing, my friend? Okay, Steve. Uh, good to hear from you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. By the way, we Kevin did a, a leadership forum, I believe, with the folks at the Commerce and Industry Association a while back. Kevin, you remember being on that? Yes. Yeah, we were talking about all kinds of leadership questions. Kevin, trick question. I'm curious. You played basketball growing up in Jersey City, New Jersey, correct? Yep. Question. How much of your leadership approach of this massive operation called Investors Bank comes from the days of being, I believe, a guard or a forward at, uh, were you at St. Peter's? Yep, at St. Peter's Prep. Steve, I wasn't big, but I was slow. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think uh, sports has a great influence, at least on my leadership style. I was a point guard. Uh, actually, uh, in my junior year, we lost to Essex Catholic. My school. Uh, in the state my tournament, right? right? And then in our senior year, we beat Seton Hall Prep and went to the state finals and lost to Christian Brothers. Is, isn't it so amazing? Is Christian, I'm sorry for interrupting. Kevin, isn't it amazing how you remember every game, oh, every yeah. score, every situation you were in in high school? For sure. For <laughs> sure. It's uh the older I get, the better I was. <laughs> and so let me ask you, in all seriousness, how much of how you lead, manage, uh, motivate, deal with difficult performance issues, how much of what you do as the leader of investors is, in fact, a product of your athletic days? Well, there's so many similarities between you know uh, sports and especially team sports and uh, running a business. I mean, you have to, first and foremost, I tell Many of our employees on the first day of work, you know, I speak to all our employees and I focus on, I call it the Derek Jeter rule, Yogi Berra, Montclair resident, That's be right. a good teammate, be a person that makes the team better. You know, don't be a giver, don't be a taker, be a giver. And it's all about being a, what I say, a, a selfless leader as opposed to a self-serving leader. Hmm. I'm curious about something as you talk about this. Yeah. The sports thing, I don't want to overplay this, but 
and I'm also not going to do a commercial for our friends at Investors, um, but you actually have a series of commercials on the air right now where two very prominent quarterbacks in the New York market, Boomer Esiason and the great Phil Simms, both of them are in fact representing investors on the air. Is that by accident? Design what? Well, it was sort of an outgrowth of our, uh, our, of our partnership with the New Jersey Devils, the uh, uh, marketing slash consulting uh, firm that we used uh, in that in advising us on our relationship with the uh, Prudential Center and the Devils organization suggested it to us. And then when you look at those two gentlemen, you know, and what they do, not just what they've done in their uh, football athletic career, but also what they continue to do in their professional career on the, in the broadcast booth, and then what they do in the uh, community. They're both, you know, mm -hmm. solid citizens. Uh, they both have active uh, charitable pursuits. In fact, uh, uh, next, this Monday, we're co-sponsoring with Phil Sims for the uh, New Jersey uh, High School uh, All-Star uh, football game All at right. Kane University. And then, you know, Boom is well known for his uh, work with uh, cystic fibrosis. Connected and, to his uh, son. We're supporting that. So when those guys are, are out there in the community, they represent the bank well. They represent th themselves uh, extremely well. And they just, you know, you know our, what we call our four C's, it's first uh, our core values. It's character, commitment, community, and cooperation. And they embrace them. You're listening to, uh, first of all, this is the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour. I'm here with my colleague, Mary Gamba. By the way, uh, we are on the line with Kevin Cummings at Investors. Mary, did Kevin get your attention when he said, quote, our relationship with the New Jersey Devils, your favorite hockey team? It is my favorite hockey team. I have two uh, sons who aren't that young anymore, uh, 13 and 16, that play hockey very competitively. So, Kevin, you definitely uh, piqued my interest with that one and also the connection between being on a team and then how you could apply that in other situations. And really taking responsibility for me is one of the lessons that I really hope my children take away in a leadership capacity is if something does go wrong, take responsibility just the same way you would if something goes right. What are your thoughts on that in terms of the connection between being on a team in a team sport and then transferring that level of responsibility into the workforce? As a leader. As a leader. Right. Well, certainly uh, people do what they see and not what they hear. Mm. And I think as a leader, you have to lead by example. So even G with Excuse me, Kevin. Give us an example of leading by example. I hate to do it that way, but go ahead. I tell you, one of the things is showing up, uh, showing up, showing up on time. And uh, when we do community events, you'll see several of our leaders, several of our senior executives at you know, the parade in Newark, the St. Patrick's Day Parade, or different events that we have and we sponsor. Uh, and that's one of the things that we found very attractive with respect to our partnership with the Devils slash Financial Center, uh, their community involvement uh, in the Newark area. And that was where we felt our, our, our core values as a company, mm -hmm. Hugh Weber, Scott O'Neill, the, the, the leaders of that organization, are very much aligned with the people that we do, uh, you know, these type of uh, partnerships. You know, Kevin, it's interesting giving back. I happened to be with our good friend Bob Feinberg last night, who is the chair of the uh, Montclair Film uh, festival, the whole Montclair film operation, Kevin and his team. If you, by the way, look up Montclair film, you'll see investors very involved because Kevin and the folks at investors got big time behind that festival. We've been talking about that for years, but it's only one. They happen to be one of our underwriters in public broadcasting. Kevin, the philanthropic piece of this, again, not to turn it into a commercial for investors, but the connection between making a lot of money for the bank, for the people who own shares, and being philanthropic. What is the role of a leader to be someone who gives back and be philanthropic if your job is to make money for the bank? Well, we've been blessed uh, with our foundation. Uh, when we went public, we, we went public in 2005 with a $500 million capital raise. And then again, in, uh, we did a, a, a total demutualization in 2014 when we raised $2.2 billion. At, that, uh, at those uh, at times, we made a contribution of uh, $20 million in, in half stock, half cash to the foundation, so a $40 million endowment. And uh, that, along with our marketing budget or slash uh, uh, philanthropic budget at the bank, really gives us the treasure so that our employees have the time, give their time and talent 
there are different causes that hopefully that they are passionate about. Is that what leadership really, is about, though, Kevin? But why is leadership well, about giving vision, to others? Yeah. yeah. Well, no, it's about creating a vision and something where someone can rally around. And, and having a vision of being a different bank that makes a difference, first and foremost, with its employees. We want our employees not just to be successful, not to only just to be good bankers, but we want them to feel a sense of significance. We want them to be significant. And when you cross from success to significance, that's when you create passion in the workplace and you create a legacy so that I want them to say, yeah, when I worked at Investors, they were the best days of my life. Real quick uh, follow-up on this before I let you go, Kevin. You and I have had conversations about how investors, uh, the culture of investors is big time, uh, all about leadership development and coaching. You have an internal person that you brought in. You've had all kinds of folks come in and do coaching and teaching and, and mentoring around leadership. Why such a focus on that when a lot of organizations I know do not do that and just assume people are going to have the skills to be leaders when they have no right to assume that? Well, if you're not getting better, and I mean this in all areas of your life, the, the intellectual, the spiritual, the physical, and the emotional, and you're going backwards. And, and Mary, you mentioned change earlier. I don't want to be better than you, but I want to be better than I was yesterday. And if you're not on a period of, in those four areas of your life, on a period of continuing you know, improvement, listening to learn, you know, all the processes that you need to make your life better, you're going backwards and you're going to get worse. And you can see it with companies. Look just recently, GE, one, you know, Jack Welsh, you know, led GE, you know, through the 80s and the 90s, a very difficult time. They were just delisted on the New York Stock. I mean, not delisted. Uh, had a, they just came out of the Dow, uh, the Dow Jones uh, Industrials. Who would have thought I mean, that would who happen? Who would have thought that? Exactly. So if you're not getting stronger and getting better, AT and T is, you know, was bought by Southwest Bell. Now, I mean, AT and T uh, we, we created so many jobs here in New Jersey. Is, is technically gone now. Ma Bell is gone, and the regional companies are what we remain. So we, I think there's so many stories of that, of if you're not getting better and constantly improving, you know, you, you're going to become uh, irrelevant or obsolete. By the way, to Kevin Cummings' point, in, in my book, Lessons in Leadership, which you can uh, actually purchase on our website, stand-deliver.com, all the articles are free. The book is there as well. There's a chapter that deals specifically with the question of great leaders are lifelong learners. And Kevin Cummings, an investor's bank, just doesn't talk about it. He lives it every day. Hey, Kevin, I want to thank you, my friend, for joining us uh, here on the Leadership Hour. Uh, Mary will continue to root for the Devils. I, in fact, will admit, while I like the Devils, I am a bit of a Ranger fan. But when Kevin's around, I root only for the Devils because he's Good my friend and sponsor. That's great to hear. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. All the best, buddy. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. That was Kevin Cummings, Investors Bank. This is Steve Adubato. That, you can't see me pointing, that is Mary Gamba. And Mary, are we going to be back? We will be right back. When? Uh, in just a few moments. Just checking. Be right back. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Steve Adubato, this is the Leadership Hour. We're on AM 970, The Answer. You could also check us out a little bit later on on our podcast of the same show, the same leadership discussion on our web, web, website. I'll get that out. I'm a professional broadcaster. Stand-deliver.com. Mary Gamba is here in the house. Mary actually runs our day-to-day -day operation uh, at Stand and Deliver. Mary, biggest takeaways from Kevin Cummings. Oh, there were so many. One that really hit home for me was the people do what they see, not what they hear, all about leading by example. I think that we see it so much in today's media, especially, uh, and I think the media has a lot of fun portraying the world in a certain light. The ability- Are you talking, are you implying <laughs> that there's anything called fake news? There's a are lot Are you really of, gonna go there? I'm not gonna go there, not today. <laughs> we can go there another time. And I think it's very, very true. I think that it's one thing to say you could write it down in a policy and procedure book. You can tell your team what to do. But until you actually live it on a day-to-day -day basis, they're not going to follow you. So you need to exhibit what it is that you want your team to be doing. Let's follow up on the sports thing. And by the way, if you've never played sports, if you've never gotten involved in sports, if your kids never did, no one in your family, that's not the issue. 
I'm just a believer as someone who grew up around sports and played sports and our kids are involved in it. Forget about the athletic part. And Mary has two kids who are talented athletes as well, 13 and 16. I just am convinced that things happen on a sports field or on the rink, if you will, or in the rink, if you will, that are not really about sports. Translation. I've seen kids strike out in a baseball game, and I've said this before, and the other kids on the team turn on that kid. I've seen them blame that kid for the loss. I've seen people conduct. I saw a kid recently on my son's baseball team throw his bat after a strikeout and then curse in an embarrassing way. His dad was right there at the game. Those aren't just lessons about sports, are they? They're, They're about leadership and life. They really are. When it comes down to sports, competitive sports, and also I think it is other, someone can be on a competitive chess team. They could be a dancer. It's all about- You could be in chorus. You could be in anything. And it's expecting as much of yourself as you expect of others, not finger pointing. I actually had written down no finger pointing. When things go wrong, it's easy to blame the goalie. Why didn't you save that? Well, you're the defenseman. Why didn't you save that? And And by the way, three minutes before you let somebody get by you and you forgot that, but you Mm -hmm. do know someone scored on the goal that's what you focus on. Is it any different in leadership in the workplace? It isn't because often you'll spend so much time focusing on what went wrong instead of figuring out how to make it right. Or sometimes you can't make it right, especially in sports. If you miss the shot, if you miss the uh, the home run in baseball, right. basketball. Or you strike out with two outs you in the ninth out, inning. Right? Exactly. I know nothing about basketball, so I can't. Well, you miss a foul shot with the game on the line. Everyone says, how can exactly. you miss a foul shot? There's no one even defending you. Mm-hmm. But someone gets anxious, nervous, or they just miss – Right. The best coaches that I've seen, and again, I just refer to hockey because that's what I know, are those coaches that remain totally placid, whether it's something very good that happened or something really bad. You don't see a reaction in their face. You don't see any emotion because they don't make a big deal out of anything. So this way, if you can stay very constant, you'll have a much clearer head when dealing with something that goes wrong. You could celebrate the win later, mm. but if you overreact in the moment about the goal or the the loss of a game or anything like that, you're not going to be able to move yourself forward. I, I'm going to push back uh, on this one. This You're listening to Mary Gamba just then, who has been my colleague for 18 going on 19 years at Stand and Deliver. We talk about, think about, write about, coach, and um, have clients all over, uh, luckily, who help pay for the bills, including this radio show podcast. Mary and I have been talking about this for a long time, but I got to tell you, Mary, the whole thing about remaining placid, st- not, you didn't say stone face, but I, I, here's my thing. Where is the place for passion, enthusiasm, and making it crystal clear that you're really pumped up when things go well? And when things don't go well, you're going to communicate with a spirit of passion, enthusiasm, <laughs> and respect that it is not acceptable and we're not going to be able to succeed, win, compete, whether it's in sports or in business. Isn't that a part of leadership, showing your emotions? I think you can show your emotions, but you need to know your audience. There are certain team members that react very well to passion. And if I'm putting little quotes around the word passion. Yeah, we're on the radio. It's hard to see the air quotes. I'm doing air quotes uh, because sometimes that passion can be perceived as uh, your boss is being mean. They're being hurtful. Oh, they're being come loud. On, grow up. You and I talk about this all the time. Yeah, and but I'm tone. serious. Grow up. It's called work. It is called work. I don't mean you. Oh, no, no. You could be mean. It's fine. But <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't be- I'm trying to make a point. Go ahead. I get your point. And you and I have agreed to disagree for a very long time that it does come down to, yes, you should be passionate. If you're not passionate in what you're doing, then okay. stop doing it and well, find another. what does it another- look like? The passion does not need to look like someone who is raising their voice, uh, you know, and I don't want to use the word yelling because then that just means that you're literally talking down to someone. And that's not always the case. But again, if you know your team and you know if they're going to react to that, you may have someone that only reacts if you yell. My my 16-year-old Will always says, Mom, you know, I, I only hear you the third time because I only hear you when you yell at me. Right. And so then that does create that type of environment where someone is going to become numb. They're not going to listen anyway. So if you treat someone with respect, dignity, and when something does go wrong, address it. But to me, you don't need to take it to that next level. Mm. I'm going to go into a risky area here. Brian Berdour, who here with us in the studio, he's going to say, I can't believe Steve did this, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. I wrote a piece recently on, uh, and it's bordering a little bit on what you're talking about. This is not a political show. This is not about politics. 
But <clears throat> I wrote a column <clears throat> that basically said the greatest leaders do not call names, do not engage in personal attacks, do not try to embarrass people publicly and ridicule them. And I have argued that I don't care what your politics are, whether you like the president's politics or not, President Trump or not, I'm not a fan of mocking people. And I think that is, I don't think, I know it is not a leadership trait that we promote in ourselves, in our kids, or the people who work with us. And you have the highest standards in the world when it comes to these things. Correct. Absolutely. And I think with, and I know that piece that you're referring to, and that piece can also be found. Yes. The piece that you wrote, uh, stand-deliver.com. It's on our website, along with a whole bunch of other great columns and leadership tips and on communication. I think it's called Great Leaders Don't Engage in Personal Attacks. Go ahead. Exactly. And that's what I'm talking about. It's, It's crossing that line. And you might argue that it is passion and it is, I need to let somebody know. And it, it may not be, oh, pounding my chest or or screaming at the top of my lungs. However, there is a huge difference between mocking someone, their personal appearance, anything that they, anything about that person. That's not right for anyone to do. Whether whether, whether you like the person, forget about politics. Doesn't it matter. could be about Trump, Obama, Hillary Clinton, anyone else. Mm-hmm. Anytime you engage in that as a leadership attribute, mm-hmm. what's the problem? Well, people are going to judge you first and foremost. If you if you do that and if other people see that you're mocking someone and if you are literally putting someone down, it's going to make you look ridiculous. It's going to make you look like less than a leader. So you're actually making yourself look worse by talking about somebody else in that fashion. We agree on that. And I will. T- but I will also say, Mary, take all that off the table, the personal attacks, the name calling, whatever else. I actually do struggle with the whole question of letting people know this is a performance issue. L- let me switch switch gears and I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. And by the way, Steve Adubato here. This is the Leadership Hour. Mary Gamba is with me as well. Mary, we've talked a lot about the issue of, quote, performance reviews. There are a lot of people listening right now who get a performance review, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. And The job of the person who's doing the reviewing, a mentor, a coach, a leader, whomever, is to be specific, concrete, and be helpful to that person. I believe that in order to give real feedback, you don't give it once or twice a year. You don't give it at the annual review. You do it consistently. You do it part of your DNA. You do it, someone does something, they perform. Imagine a coach of a baseball team waiting until the middle of the season to talk to, uh, I was going to say Derek Jeter, but right now um, Aaron Judge. You talk to him after every at bat. Is it any different when it comes to day-to-day leadership? Don't you have to talk to people in a very direct, sometimes they're uncomfortable with, with way when you're telling them where they fell short? Don't you have to do it on the spot? You often ask me to wait. You've often asked me, it's a little too soon. Hold back. Let's well, that's talk about because this. of your uh, air quotes passion at the moment. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're using that word a lot. Yeah. Passion. So oftentimes, yes, I have said to you. You mean I'm those, too angry in the moment to be objective and rational and really take a step back and address the issue rather than addressing whether it's the person or the thing. It's a matter of uh, we've talked about this many times. The 24 hour rule. Explain now, to folks the 24 hour rule because I don't know if you can wait 24 hours. In in certain situations, it would be very time sensitive, but any major conversation that you're going to have with an employee, of course, we're talking about, if we're talking about minor, if someone sends an email and they address it to the wrong name and you, you got to fix it right away. You have to I'm fix it right I'm talking about away. a real performance issue that's consistent, that hurts the organization and you got to deal with it. And I'm, I'm ready to do it right now. And I'm feeling it right now. I'm in the moment right now. And you tell me, you know, why don't you wait until tomorrow and we'll talk about it. I'm like, no, I'm going to do this now, Mary. Mm-hmm. You may say something that you're going to regret. Everything seems elevated, escalated in that moment. Everything seems a 10 when maybe it's only a 6 or a 7 in terms of the severity of what the it is. So giving that 24-hour rule, and we live it in sports. If you have an issue with the coach, we're not even allowed, and it's we're not even allowed, our child is not even allowed to go and talk to the coach until 24 hours later. Because whether it was a matter of playing time or whether it was a matter of I didn't like that you short-shifted me or whatever the the it is yeah in hockey and or maybe if in baseball you didn't get played at all or you were told you were going to pitch but johnny was a better pitcher that day if you address the coach at that moment you may say something that you're going to regret you so, may whoa, whoa, mm-hmm. whoa sorry for interrupting are you talking about leadership are you saying mary gamba 
in the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour where I'm supposed to have all the answers, but clearly don't. Are you saying that patience is a virtue as a leader? I think it is one of the best top virtues as a leader, yes. In certain instances, again, certain things, if they are time sensitive and need to be addressed immediately, address them. You could even address a major issue in the moment, but wait to have that sit down, wait to really engage until you give yourself time to process what is the difference between the problem and your reaction and how you're feeling about that problem. You really Mm. do need to separate out your emotions a little bit. By the way, I just want to thank our friends at AM970 once again for giving us this opportunity every week to bring you the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Mary Gamba. Go on our website at uh, stand-deliver.com. Follow me on Twitter at... Uh, on Twitter at Steve Adubato. That's A-D-U-B-A-T-O. And then on Facebook as well at Steve Adubato, Ph.D. Uh, which really is my segue into this. So, Mary, here's the deal. This is a loaded question. What impact? You're talking about being patient. You're talking about waiting 24 hours. In a world where instant communication is the rule, where people tweet and they Instagram stuff and they post stuff on Facebook, and what is the patience rule and what is the impact on social? People are like, I'm going to lead on Twitter. And, and again, not about the president or anyone else. Everyone's doing it. How the heck are you supposed to be patient when people want and need information immediately? Just because we want and need it doesn't mean that we should have it. And what? often you see on, and again, it it isn't even the president. It's there's not other, about the there's, president. There's actors. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a an actor who had tweeted something very not kind about someone uh, in an award show. And he immediately retracted. He sent out another tweet. I am so sorry. I reread it. So it could be accidental or it could be intentional. Either way. Mary, stop. People say things on social. Here's the reason I'm raising this about leadership. I'm arguing that the degree of discipline, the degree of self-control on social media for real leaders, people want to be leaders, is much greater than anyone can imagine because people were just saying, that's what I'm thinking, so that's what I say. And then all of a sudden, if you're with a company, you're with a brand, you're, you're, you're out there in the marketplace and you're retracting, oh, that's not what I really, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Well, hasn't social media changed the rules for leaders to make them even more disciplined than ever before? Hopefully. The best leaders, uh, we were talking before with Kevin Cummings, and we'll be talking to a lot of other leaders here on Steve Adubato's Leadership Hour, Sundays at 2 p.m. every Sunday. On AM 970. On AM 970. And real leaders aren't going to use social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook. How about sending an email to send a sensitive, difficult, complex message to a team member or someone else? Good or bad leadership move? I think that that is a bad leadership move. Isn't you need it faster? To do it. Of course it's faster. But what's and wrong with it? It's perfect if you wake up in the middle of the night, as you often do, Steve, and 3 a.m., sorry for the How crazy hours. How do you know hours. I'm even sleeping, but go ahead. Exactly, and you may not. Maybe you just are a vampire yes, and you just yes. never, ever sleep. Let's not go there. Exactly. Leadership and sleep. We'll talk on the next yeah. leadership hour. Go ahead. Exactly. So if you wake up in the middle of the night and you say, wow, I totally forgot to send X, Y, Z to Mary. I'm just going to shoot out an email right now. So this way, tomorrow, she'll get up and she'll see it. That's fine. Okay. If you have an issue or a problem and you are hiding behind social media. And it's been bothering me for a while. And email is not the way to go. Why not? Sure, you could write it, read it, rewrite it. So that's one of the advantages because you could choose your words. On the flip side, you may just spew off a whole bunch of words and next thing you know, the person gets it. And it number one, it wasn't even received as intended. Something Message that sent does not equal message received. Go ahead. Exactly. So you cannot put tone into an email. You could not put a laugh. Maybe you meant something as a joke. It's taken uh, more personally than a joke. How about the email that comes in all bold? There was a, a leader a while back who sent an email to all of his people. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to say the name of the company. Uh, the, the leader sent an email because he wanted more of his people. He said, I mean, he, because when I, here's what the email said. All right, employees, here's the deal. When I come in the morning, the parking lot is half full. When I leave, there are only a quarter of the spaces that have cars in them. That's going to change in the morning. I need people here at 7.30 in the morning till 7.30 at night. New rules, my rules. The clock just started ticking, tick-tock, tick-tock. By the way, check this out. It's a real email. Sent it out in all caps. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. 
that is exactly the type of email that you don't want to send, obviously, for all the reasons that you just explained. (laughs) First of all, if you are a true leader, you should be there before everyone else gets there. You should stay later than anyone else does because, frankly, you are the leader of that organization. So you need to be really putting in that time and showing that you are just as committed as you expect them to be. But this leader wanted to let everybody know the rules were changing. You wanted to do it right in the moment via email all in caps. And most likely— Screaming. Exactly, yes, screaming. And most likely that leader at that point was probably so far gone that it didn't matter in his mind if he were to send it out. There were probably months, years of built up resentment or anger or frustration. Where are these people? I'm here. Exactly. Hey, I'm putting in all this time. Well, maybe you lost your people a long time ago. So maybe you should look inward as a leader instead of just saying in all caps in an email. And right there, that goes to show you that he or she was not a great leader. Because that was a very challenging conversation to have with your employees who... Or face to face. Yeah, absolutely. These employees may have child care. They may have to drop off their kids. Who knows? Or maybe they just don't like working there anymore. Yeah. Hey, listen, folks. Um, I cannot believe an entire half hour has gone by. The first half hour of the Steve Autobato Leadership Hour, right after this, you'll be, uh, we'll be picking up State of Affairs with Steve Autobato. We'll be talking to all kinds of state leaders in the state of New Jersey, talking about difficult, complex challenges that I assure you cannot be solved via email, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, check out our website, stand-deliver.com. And uh, this is Steve Adubato. That is Mary Gamba. And we'll be back next week for the Leadership Hour. This is Mary Gamba. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, where we look at the most pressing issues facing the state of New Jersey. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Hi, I'm Patrick Dunnikin. At Gibbons, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the complex issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at Two Gateway. Funding has been provided by the law firm of Gibbons PC. RWJ Barnabas Health, the New Jersey Education Association, PSENG, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities, NJM Insurance Group, Verizon, and by International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Promotional support provided by Commerce Magazine and by Observer New Jersey Politics. Hi, Steve Adubato here, coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio in beautiful Brick City, Newark, New Jersey. It is my honor to introduce a gentleman who knows this city very well, the former mayor, the United States Senator from the great state of New Jersey, Cory Booker. Good to see you, Senator. Great to see you, man. Great to see you. We go way back. It's one of these times that uh, I'm sure you have this with so many people. You've known them for 20, 30, 40 years, worked with them. Yeah, well, not 40 with you. <laughs> when you ran for the Central Ward yeah. Council seat, you were in your... 20s, if I I'm was not in mistaken. My 20s. Uh, 19, I guess I moved to the city around 1996. Your dad was one of the first people I met with yeah. uh, who saw things in me I didn't see in myself. By the way, quote, for those who are following us everywhere, my dad was just a little bit involved in politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's your, my version. Your Go dad ahead. was New Jersey's perhaps last Italian machine boss. And I don't mean that in any negative way because you and I were talking off camera. Talk about a guy who has affected generations in this city, mm-hmm. built educational institutions honoring seniors through incredible uh, uh, facilities and programming. I mean, he's left a mark on this city in a way that few people have uh, in the last century. Thank you, Senator. Let me ask you this. You have been influenced. We'll talk about politics, and we'll talk about immigration, tax policy, whole range of issues, uh, the opioid crisis. Can I ask you this? Your view of leadership and the way you lead in the United States Senate and the way you may lead this country one day comes from where? Look, Newark, I, I always say that, uh, you know, when you govern here, it sears away all partisanship. You just have challenges. You've got to fix things. You've got to fix them quick. And I always say I got my BA from Stanford with my PhD on the streets of Newark because this city uh, adopted me, taught me. Uh, some of my greatest life heroes, American heroes, are Newark residents. And uh, I just learned you have to create uncommon coalitions to create uncommon results. And so I went down to, to 
uh, Washington with a mayor's mentality, uh, mm. having, look, I, Chris Christie and I could write a dissertation on our disagreements, but he was the mayor, governor of the state, I was the mayor of the largest city. We had to find common ground to stand on. And Newark's boom right now, the first time in 60 years our population is growing, biggest economic development period in 60 years. So much of that is because he and I mm. fought through our differences to find common ground and did good things. And so that's where I am in Washington, whether it's the infrastructure in this region, which is 100 years out of date in some cases. Uh, and dangerous in some cases. And dangerous. <clears throat> and so working with a Mississippi Republican, Roger Wicker, to pass legislation to get us money to try to rebuild our New Jersey transit infrastructure, that win was because of that attitude. Uh, finding ways to protect veterans' access to traumatic brain injury centers here in New Jersey with uh, Dean Heller, Republican from Arizona. We got that done because of finding common ground. Uh, and even uh, the biggest economic development bill perhaps passed in, in decades uh, that gives much better tax treatment if you invest in low-income areas like Camden, Trenton, Newark. Uh, that bill, which is going to bring billions of dollars into communities like Newark, um, was done because I found common ground with Tim Scott across the aisle. So New Jerseyans who pay too much taxes, who send too much money down to Washington, get too little back. If I was just going to be a partisan down there as opposed to a problem solver, we would get uh, I, I would be not scoring as many points for the state. You know, on this, it's not just really a question of leadership. It's a question of getting things done, which may yeah. be another way to say the same thing. Is it harder, Senator, in Washington, in this current environment, with the polarization that most of us see, to accomplish things and be the leader you want to be? So, yeah, I mean... It, I'm not just talking, respectfully, I'm not just talking about your colleagues in the United States Congress and the Senate. I'm talking about the other branch of government that is elected, the executive. Look, I think there's nothing, if you're New Jerseyan, like we, we are such a diverse state. We don't care if you're Italian, if you're black. New Jersey has the only state with two minorities we sent down. They don't care That's if right. Menendez and I are black and Latino. They just like, can you guys get the job done? Fine. I couldn't believe that I'm the fourth elected African-American in the history of our country, popularly elected African-American to the Senate. And it wasn't even an issue on the campaign trail. Nobody seemed to care. They're just like, can you get the job done? That's New Jersey. But this has been a tough year and a half where I just have never seen things that are happening now in New Jersey. We have sick Americans with turbans getting heckled in New Jersey transit stations. When, when has that happened before, when we were growing up? At the, at the rate and level it's happening now, it's almost like this thin, narrow band of, uh, of, of folks with bigoted ideals feel this license to hate now, openly, like we haven't seen before in our country. What do you think it is? I, I don't know <clears throat> what it is, but I do know in times of tough economic stripes, as much as you want to talk about the unemployment rate. New Jerseyans, as, as all Americans, we have this common pain where we're working harder and harder, but making less money. If you were a baby boomer in America, 90% of baby boomers did better than their parents. If you're a millennial, it's a coin toss, 50-50 chance. Mm. We're seeing an economic environment where everything's going up, cost of prescription drugs, everything's going up, the cost of college. So people are being squeezed, and I think it's creating a lot of insecurity. And, and demagogues try to play on that and try to blame Mexicans or Muslims or what have you, as opposed to seeing this as a time of common pain, we should create more of a sense of common purpose. Uh, we have folks that are trying to play upon that. And in a time of news fracturing where truth is, is getting squelched more and more and you see these lies coming out, I think that's breeding a very combustible mm -hmm. environment. And, but this is the time that individuals, not presidents or senators, but all of us need to have a more courageous love and empathy for each other Sen and understand we're all in this together. Senator, on the question of immigration, as we do this program, folks, it is toward the end of June. We don't know exactly what's going to happen on the immigration issue. And the immigration issue is much more than, but very much tied to the current situation as we speak right now with children at the borders being separated, if you will, from their parents. I'm not going to get into a back and forth as to who's to blame for it, but the question is, what does that represent in your mind as to what our country stands for. If that were to continue in, we don't know what's gonna happen moving forward. Go ahead, Senator. Well, this has affected thousands of people already. This is, I have to say this, you know, I, I sometimes say if, you, if this country hasn't broken your heart, you don't love her enough. This is a heartbreaking moment. This is a shameful chapter in American history. We, we've seen it before, you're an immigrant family. You're here because people escaping persecution, whether you're Irish American, escaping fam, famine, Italian American, facing uh, oppressive conditions in Italy, came here. They didn't wait for a visa. They got mm -hmm. on boats, ships, crossed perilous waters to come here. I, I'm telling you, this is a morally repugnant moment. We are doing this. Our government is doing things that violate our common values. Is it a moment? It is. It, I, I pray 
that it's a moment. And this is not assaulting just the dignity of those people at the border. This is an assault on American dignity, on the humanity of us, who we claim to be as a country. And that you have conservative leaders, whether it's Catholic <clears throat> leaders, Christian evangelicals, former Republican First Lady uh, uh, Bush, Laura Bush, Laura Bush <clears throat> all coming out and saying, no, we are Americans. We stand for things. This is, a, this is moral vandalism on our values. I, I'm hoping that more and more people will stand up. And I have to say, I have to warn Americans. There's not many moments like this where you have to understand the opposite of justice is not injustice always. It's often apathy, indifference, inaction. This is a time, whether it was like people being beat on a bridge in Alabama. Pettus Bridge. Yeah, it had been Pettus Bridge, whether it was... Including um, United States Congressman John Lewis as a 21-year-old. There's these moral moments where you can't just be silent. You have to speak out against it. It's not a partisan thing. This is about patriotism, a nation that believes in love, inclusion, believes in ideals that we conduct ourselves in a certain way. We are the protectors of human rights and human decency, not the afflictors uh, mm -hmm. uh, and assaulting. So please speak out. Call your Congress. And by the way, we live in a state where we have Republican and Democratic Congress people who don't sanction this kind of stuff. This is time for us to speak By out. By the way, uh, United States Senator Cory Booker, how can people follow you on Twitter? I don't know if you've gotten involved in social media. I'm not sure <laughs> you have many followers. I, I, I am blessed. <laughs> And it's all the same, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Cory Booker. Cory See, Booker. All one word. Did, I know you don't like doing this, Senator Booker. Uh, by the way, Steve Adubato here with uh, United States Senator Cory Booker. Do you have like a couple thousand people following you on I Twitter? I am blessed to have millions of people following Millions me. and yes. millions. Yes. You sound like Carl Sagan right I, now. I'm, I'm, I'm I, dating uh, myself. No, it's terrible. All right, we know where to go. Are you ready? Yes. Let's try this. Uh, we, in fact, we are speaking with Senator Booker, and now I want to deal with the question of SALT, S-A-L-T, yeah. state and local deductions. The federal government, through the most recent tax policy, is if you live in Jersey or you live in New York, you know about this. There is a limit. It's 10 grand, 10,000, that's it. Property taxes, state taxes, that's all you can write off. Let's just say, Senator, if you live in certain communities in New Jersey, I happen to be in Montclair, a beautiful town, <clears throat> that will help, but it will not help that much. What can and what should be done to try to undo that, or is that it, 10 grand? You can't so, write it off after that. So I live in the central ward of Newark in a low-income, working-class neighborhood. I pay more than $10,000 in property taxes. So let's understand what this was. This was an awful tax bill that most Republicans in New Jersey in the congressional delegation... Did the Trump White House drive it? Trump White House drove it. Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan drove it. Most, not all of our Republicans, but most Republicans in our delegation voted against it because it specifically targeted New Jersey, which is the number one state in America. Why? for sending more money to Washington than we get back. Why would New Jersey be targeted? Because we're a blue state, like other blue states from California to New York. They said, let's pay for this big corporate tax relief, you taking away a deduction from states like New York and New Jersey. And so this was a direct assault designed to hurt New Jerseyans. One out of 10 New Jerseyans are gonna be paying more, higher taxes this year because of this. They're losing their state and local deduction. All to do what? To give corporations who have an 80 year corporate profit high, to mm -hmm. give them more of a tax break, Working class people in New Jersey, working families are paying for that tax cut. But Senator Booker, respectfully, the Trump administration says we're creating more jobs, jobs that didn't exist before, and that's good for the economy, you say? I don't say. I look at data. When I was mayor of the city, I used to say, God, we trust, but everybody else bring me data. And so what have corporations done with their tax, uh, their, their tax bonanza? Have they hired more people? Have they invested in infrastructure or research, or, or, uh, research and development? No. Overwhelmingly, they've taken these profits and used them for what? Stock buybacks, which used to be illegal in our country because it was stock manipulation, but they're just using it to enrich the investors, 30% of whom are not even American mm. citizens. So they're, they're not investing in our country. They're not creating and expanding jobs. And so this is, this is this ideal that we already make fun of, this idea of trickle-down economics. If they wanted to design a tax plan that gave working New Jerseyans a real tax break and made that permanent, remember, the tax breaks they've given in this are not permanent They're not, for individuals. They sunset. They sunset. By the Which means that's tax, it. Corporate, corporate tax, tax is in permanent. Perpetuity. In, in perpetuity. And so this is an, the, every okay. New Jerseyan should be offended by this. Right. That's why our Republican congressmen, the people who are against it, and that's why I stand with the governor for trying to create Governor, Murphy. Mechan, governor Murphy, who's trying to create mechanisms where towns can set up 501c3 so you can pay like me. I can pr pay the 10000 to, to Newark, and I can pay the few thousand over my, mm. uh, that uh, to, to a nonprofit, get the tax break on my federal taxes. You're listening to United States Senator, you're also watching United States Senator Cory Booker. This is Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the NJTV studio, Newark, the Agnes Vera studio. Senator, when we come back, let's do the Gateway Tunnel, let's do the opioid yes. crisis and as many other issues yeah. that we can cover. Steve Adubato, Cory Booker, we'll be right back right after this. 
To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Steve Adubato here. Um, we are talking to United States Senator. See, look at people outside the studio. They are taking pictures, not of me, but in fact of Senator Booker. It's the haircut. Is that what <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. Um, the op opioid crisis. Yes. What, where are we? What are you doing? I know there's a bill that's moved in the House, yes. it's passed in the House and the Senate. Uh, some of our friends over at St. Joseph's wow. uh, Medical Center, they're very involved in this. They, they in terms of ED. Me. Yeah. They're trying to cut out the use the overuse and abuse of opioids in the ED, other hospitals as well. Go ahead. Well, they're doing two things. One is trying to lower the, pres the prescribing of these opioids when you really don't need them. And number two is they're seeing when you do overdoses, people come to the hospital, they often leave and they, they'll overdose again. But they found a way to dramatically cut that down, a model for New Jersey. And, and their, their data can't be argued with. So I looked at that and said, this is something that actually works. It's an evidence-based solution uh, to this to this global to this national crisis, epidemic like like proportions. Uh, the death rates are out out of control in our state and what others. What can the federal government do, Senator? They Booker? can number one, we could fund programs like this that are evidence-based investments. Actually, save money for taxpayers long range because if you invest in stopping repeated overdose, you're mm. stopping uh, uh, the cost of of these addictions. And so we need to fund these programs. And I'm so happy that my bill. Uh, this Alto bill, this this uh, uh, alternatives to opioids to, to, towards opioids uh, is now part of that legislation as well and moving through con through Congress. So we need to fund more money to programs at work, and we need to find the best practices around our country and attack this problem. If this was a foreign attack that mm -hmm. took this many lives, we saw what happened after 9/11: 3,000 lives. Uh, 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 literally, we've, we've spent hundreds of billions of dollars as a result mm -hmm. of that. This is tens and tens of thousands of lives, but we're not treating it like the crisis that it is. Senator Booker, the Gateway Tunnel may sound like a purely, quote unquote, uh, if you're listening on the radio, those are air quotes, purely an infrastructure project. That Gateway Tunnel, New York, New Jersey connection, where are we? What's the problem? And if the Trump administration and others in Congress, the Republican Congress and others who say, no, that's your problem, New York. That's your problem, New Jersey. It's not our problem. What is the tunnel? Why does it matter to everyone in this nation? Everyone. The, the Obama administration, before they left, they said the number one infrastructure project in all of America, all of North America, is the busiest rail corridor in North America. Did the Obama administration put enough money into it? They prioritized it. We were flying down the tracks. When I got into office, this project was dead. We weren't even talking to each other. I, I remember Schumer was attacking Chris Chuck Christie. Schumer in New York. Everything. Right. We were yelling at each other, blaming each other. I called. I said, time out. Summit meeting in my office. So, excuse me, New York was blaming New Jersey. New Jersey was blaming New York, and the tunnel wasn't being built. It, but nothing was happening. Frozen on the tracks. We had a summit meeting in my office. Chris Christie, Bob Menendez, Secretary of Transportation, all of us said, yes. Everybody stood up. The governor at that time, the, 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 the regional senators, we all said, you're right. Stop our, our fighting. Let's put together a plan. We put together a plan. I got legislation passed in, in the federal government to arm New Jersey with better policies. We, we invested the money to start moving again. Everything was looking what good. What happened? Trump got elected and now has been trying to frustrate the project, but we still had great leaders, Republican Rodney Freelandheisen stepping up and saying, hey, I'm a pro of the House, I'm gonna help out. This has been a bipartisan thing, because everybody understands the infrastructure in our region is crumbling. You could travel half an hour faster on the Northeast Corridor in the 1960s by rail than you can now. We're literally going backwards. People who live in New Jersey are having their lives upended. They have to leave earlier. They can't take their kids to school. This is killing our productivity, costing us billions of dollars in this region because we're being choked by inadequate infrastructure. Senator, Devil's Advocate, Senator Booker, uh, Steve Adubato here, if you're just checking us out. Uh, someone says, you know, we can't afford it. Just cannot afford such a massive uh, capital investment in New York and New Jersey. Can't do it. Right. It's not, and listen, we're not against the project. Yeah. We just can't hey. do it right now. Hey, Timing's I, off. I'd say this simply. If you've got a hole in your roof, can you not afford to fix it? The longer you wait, the more expensive it gets, the more damage is done to your house. Senator, you make it sound like it has to be done sooner or later. Oh, if the tooth, is, the if we the don't gateway. do this, if we don't do this, and we have to pull one of those tunnels out of service to repair it, traffic Armageddon that would affect everywhere from Boston to Washington, D.C., crippling 10-20% uh, of our, the U.S. economy, the most productive e economic region in the, in the country, would cost us hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars would cost this region to have that kind of crippling. There is no country on the planet Earth 
the most valuable economic reason, the busiest river crossing mm. in North America, they would allow this to have happened. We have got to step up and, and understand that we're the first generation, you and I. We inherited the best infrastructure on the planet Earth from our parents and grandparents. What are we doing with We've it? We've trashed it, and we're about to hand over $3 trillion of infrastructure deficit to our kids. Republicans used to lead this charge. Eisenhower Highway Act. 1950s. It's it the equivalent of a trillion dollars of public investment today. We are irresponsible. We took our parents home, trashed it, and now about to pass it off to our kids in a horrible condition. I say no. I say let's invest. I say if you're a New Jersey commuter, you deserve better for all the money you're paying. And it's about time that we create that partnership. 50-50 spend. Feds state, in the state. State spend 50%. Feds, all of us investing, who will reap the benefits? Every American who goes will reap the benefits. Carter. Not just that. No. Those, remember, our region is integrated with every other economic region. If you have a backup. Inter this is an international issue? It is an international <clears throat> issue. It's American competitiveness issue. If this breaks down, it's going to affect the economy from coast to coast, okay. north to south. Senator Booker, uh, you touched on this, but you didn't give it a name before. Um, Jackie, uh, the zones are called opportunity zones. You didn't actually call it that. Give me 30 seconds on an opportunity um, zone and why it matters. Probably the most impactful bill I've ever passed. I partnered with a Republican. We basically said, if you invest Can in the local... Can you say a Republican's name? Yeah, sure. Tim Scott. He's the other big ball, 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 yes. guy, ball, guy, ball guy in the Senate. Um, Do you guys have your own caucus? We got a ball, ball guy, guy caucus. <laughs> Democrats and Republicans? We're Democrats and Republicans. We have some women to come in, in as well. We want to get a diverse uh, caucus of, of, of follically challenged people. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. Now, we, go back to the, to the tax plan. We basically said, look... <laughs> We have all these people who want to invest in foreign countries and emerging right. markets. We've got domestic emerging markets. There are low-income areas like Camden, Trenton, Newark, Detroit. You pick your, your, your community, uh, rural areas as well who aren't getting the investment they deserve. And so we basically said, let's say that if you are an investor and are willing to take capital off the sidelines and invest in a rural or urban poor area, we're going to give you no capital gains tax. And so in other words, we're going to start getting investments in areas mm -hmm. to create jobs, business opportunities in areas that have long been neglected because they lack the moral imagination of capitalism, uh, of capital that can really invest Is in the community. Is there support for it both sides we of the aisle? We got it done. It's the law of the it's land. It's the law of the land. We, I heard somebody talk who knows economic investment. So, so President Trump signed this? Signed it. Literally. See, good things can happen. Listen. This was called by one group the biggest economic development bill in a generation in Washington, and it's going to drive billions of dollars into communities uh, like Camden, like Newark, uh, uh, and across this country. Let's shift gears. We're talking about uh, economic matters as well. United States Senator Cory Booker, we have him for the entire half hour. Steve out about here. Legalizing marijuana. There are efforts in states all across the nation. You say a federal issue. What specifically should be done? You believe in legalizing Yeah, we have marijuana. federal prohibition now. Even states that have legalized marijuana, they're violating federal law. So I say basically two sides to this. One is deschedule it. Take, it. take it away from being an illegal drug on the federal level. Let every state make up their own decision. And then two, and this is the justice as aspect of it, remember no difference between, uh, 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 you know, rich and poor or black and white for using drugs. But if you're poor in America, you're much more likely to have a, a, a arrest record for doing things that two of the last three presidents admitted to doing. If you're black, almost four times more likely than someone white, even though there's no difference in usage. So we've got to talk, start talking about restorative justice. Expunge the records of people who, who, who if you're going to legalize marijuana, remember, if you have a felony arrest for possession of marijuana, Remember, we had more people arrested last year for marijuana mm -hmm. crimes than for all violent crimes combined. But, Senator, respectfully doing this, some would argue that it is, in fact, sending the wrong message to young people and others that you can get high, marijuana, potentially, some believe it's a gateway drug, you well, say. Well, this is what we do. We have kids, small amount of marijuana, they, for the rest of their lives, they didn't even serve jail time, but they can't vote in many states. They can't get Pell Grants. They can't get business licenses. Why are we punishing Should people? Should there be like any punishment? I believe we should be moving towards, in the state of New Jersey, just like we saw with prohibition on alcohol, it caused incredible amounts of violence. Uh, it broke families up. Uh, it cost us billions of dollars to enforce. Small amounts of marijuana, mm -hmm. we should be legalizing that, and we should be expunging records, taking the tax revenue and investing in things like education, treatment, and the, kind, and the, and the like. Marijuana, w the war on drugs has been an absolute failure, costing us billions of dollars of, of, of public money, mm -hmm. destroying lives, and giving people lifetime sentences for doing things that senators, congresspeople, presidents all brag about doing. We've had legalized marijuana for a long time for people that are privileged, the college kids that do it with no worries. It's a social justice it's issue. It's a social justice issue. Uh, Senator, you may not expect this question, but it is largely because the question is coming because we're involved in an initiative 
talking about the issues that affect infants and toddlers. It's actually an initiative called Right from the Start NJ, question. And we've talked to the Governor Murphy about this, Lieutenant Governor uh, Sheila Oliver right in this studio, she was talking about it. What is the role of the federal government to protect and help infants and toddlers, okay, when it comes to early childhood education, yeah. child care? Is that a federal issue? It, it is an American issue. And what other countries are doing right now, casting a shadow on us, Are shameful. they ahead of us? Way ahead. How? Well, remember, in a global knowledge-based society, the most productive economic unit you have is not a unit of coal or a unit of oil, gas. The most valuable natural resource we have is the genius of our children. Brain development happens, the majority of it, from, from the time in your womb to your first, second year. And we are a country right now that doesn't, we have infant mortality rates that are as high as some developing nations. We are not investing in the, in the well-being and the development of the brains of our children, and that's sinful. And so what's Germany doing? What's Japan doing? They're all investing in early childhood development, all investing in prenatal care, while America, we're letting people fend for themselves. That is criminal to me in a, in a globally competitive environment. Is it un-American? It is un-American. We should be the number one nation for investing in children, investing in child well-being, elevating. We have, we have 20 percent of our children born in poverty. Other countries have, are eliminating child poverty. And so we're America. We, we should show our values, not by our ability to create billionaires and millionaires, but our value to make sure that every child has a fair fight, a fair chance in this life to nurture and cultivate their genius. Got about a minute left. <clears throat> Does the year 2020 mean anything to you in terms of People have different things they want to do in their lives. Yes. They want to get promoted. They want to anchor new shows. I'm doing everything I want to do. I'm blessed that way. Yeah. Is there something you would like to do in 2020 beyond what you're doing today? Well, I appreciate of, you asking me that question because I'm, curious. I'm up for re-election in 2020. Are you really? I am. I am. So for re-election to the United States Senate? Yes. Are yes. you curious about 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in any way, Senator? I, I wish 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue right now would do the right thing by... Uh, the state of New Jersey, stop attacking our taxes, do the right thing by uh, uh, children at the border, not violating our values. And if you perceive that is not happening, do you engage in the possibility of, hey, listen, I want to get into this and have a discussion with others about what the presidency well, should be. Well, I hope be. to be back here to talk about it, because you're a friend. I, I feel comfortable. This would say between <laughs> us, I'm sure. Um, but I will say that what we all should be focusing on is November in this state. Yeah. We could flip a number of House seats, which would create a check Two and balance. We could win this House back in New Jersey by flipping a number of House seats and, and having a check and balance on the presidential power that would force us to work <laughs> together more and get things done. Way well played, United States Senator Cory Booker. I want to thank you, thank you for joining friend. us. Appreciate thank you very it. much. Steve Adubato here. That is Cory Booker, and um, we thank you for joining us. Check out next time. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by the law firm of Gibbons PC, RWJ Barnabas Health, the New Jersey Education Association, PSENG, NJM Insurance Group, Verizon, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. And by these public-spirited organizations, individuals, and associations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the important issues facing the Garden State. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who teach our children, the public sector employees who maintain our infrastructure, the workers who craft our manufactured goods, and New Jersey's next generation of leaders, the people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. I could feel my lungs fill with oxygen and I got my life back. The sharing network means to me hope, life, and everything. The sharing network was a lifeline to me when I really needed it. We are an organ procurement organization. The core purpose of the New Jersey Sharing Network is to save and enhance lives. To honor those who gave. Pay tribute to those who received. Offer hope to those who continue to wait. And remember the lives lost while waiting. For the gift of life. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources.